Jim, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. You know, Jim, um, you know, one of the reasons I've asked you to come on the show is because of kind of this reflection I've been doing over the past several years. You know, it's it's funny, you know, especially within the healthcare industry, everyone, you know, they, they've got this group of people that they call the invincibles. But, you know, as I've been doing this kind of reflection, I'm, you know, I'm 50 years old. My parents who are my heroes, I mean, you got my dad who was a bull rider and a boxer in Mexico, um, right. you know, and then came to the United States with my mom and my mom, you know, it's oftentimes she's even tougher than my dad, but, you know, they've been retired for some time and, in that retirement now, you know, as, as they've gotten older, they're taking a lot more trips over to the doctors. Um, they've got a lot more ailments. They've got things that hurt, you know, and as I've kind of been doing this reflection portion, you know, I have really, you know, begun to think about it. Obviously it comes with age, you know, what would happen if, what would happen if something happened to me? You know, what would happen to my daughters? What would happen to Amy, you know, the girls and whether we'd like to admit it or not, you know, I think we all kind of go through that sense of reflection and it's this idea of wanting to make sure that our loved ones are cared for and they're not left with some sort of, you know, financial burden. And so, you know, to the audience, you know, this is why we asked Jim um, to come on to come on to with us today and just kind of tell us a little bit something about what he does. You know, um, and I'll start off with, you know, Jim lives in Sacramento, so he's he's here locally. He's a Sac State grad, um, coach Little League um, and works for Northwestern Mutual guiding people with their life insurance and he's here to kind of talk to us talk to us about um life insurance but at the same time really that idea of not leaving your loved ones um saddled with financial debt and once again thank thank you jim for being here with us thank you for having me i think um the biggest uh concept i think we're going to discuss is uh financial security right um and that can mean everything it can mean you know making sure you know you Heck, you're talking about your parents being retired. My dad's 82. T no health issues, thank God. But between his ears, plenty of health issues. And um, I'm finding myself going to the Bay Area a lot just to kind of be there with him because my mom passed away 11 years ago. So anyway, so yeah, so financial security. Thank God one of the things we're not thinking about is taking care of them financially, right? Nice. At least the, the taking care of is emotional and not financial. My dad did a good job of, of making his financial house uh, rock solid. So we're not financially supporting him. We're emotionally supporting him. Well, Jim, you know, before we start off on, on that path, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Um, obviously, your, your parents, where you grew up, where you were raised, schools, and, and uh, you know, what were you into as a kid? <laughs> Star Wars. Star Wars and G.I. Joe's. <laughs> no, I... Hector, I turned 50 in 20 days and, you know, you talk about reflection. Uh, so real quick, my dad is a, is fresh from Greece, uh, came here in 1967 after he met my mom two weeks later, married her. And it wasn't some romantic thing. I think they, they, they arranged them. They said, Hey, this guy's 27. He's running around the village alone. Um, this girl's 22. Let's, let's get them set up. So it wasn't a love story. It was kind of like they put them together my mom was here. My dad was in Greece. They brought her here to the United States and my dad worked his butt off. You know, he waited tables in, uh, in San Francisco at, as in the Paoli's restaurant, which is not there anymore, but apparently was a gangster hangout and a very, you know, celebrity hangout. So, you know, my dad was the quiet immigrant that just kind of did his job and got paid. And I always tell kids when I do junior achievement that if uh, my dad made $10, he saved nine. So grew up in the Bay area in San Bruno, um, always liked math because my dad owned a deli and because I'm the oldest son, I was the one that went to the deli with him all the time. And in doing that, uh, my dad made me count back the change. I was eight years old counting back the change at the deli. And so he just kind of taught me math there. And so math became my favorite subject. And then um, high school rolled around and I started collecting baseball cards because I was short and couldn't date. <laughs> <laughs> But I, but, but Hector in that, I, I, I bought baseball cards for this price and I sold them for this price. And so, you know, I kind of learned that's kind of how stock works. Yeah. And so I went to Sac State as a finance major and never changed and got my degree in business and concentration in finance in 1996 and then started in Northwestern Mutual at 1994 
at the age of 21 as an intern and have been here ever since. So we're going on 29 years with the company. I, that's a that's a great story on your on your on your parents. I mean, you know, getting to meet um, or be their agents, and they they're, they were together for all these years. That's amazing. Yeah, it was forty four years, and it was funny because Hector, you you'll appreciate this. You know, the divorce rate's so high in the United States, right? Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I I thought it was a good idea to go to marital counseling the second Laura and I got engaged as a preventative measure. And boy, do we need marital counseling, right? Because it's 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 good to have a third party there. I remember my dad joked once, he goes, uh, he goes, you know what? 44 years, no marital counselor, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Is that when you got into the financial, uh, life insurance business or, or what did you, what did you go from there? Yeah. So, so, you know, one of the, yeah, Northwestern mutual was, was purely a life insurance company when I joined, this was 1994 and you got recognized for selling a lot of life insurance policies. So I kind of, uh, uh, cut my teeth selling small life insurance policies to my college buddies. Mm. So small whole life plans, you know, I said, Hey, you know, you're going to save money with me one day. Here's a way to save $20 a month, $50 a month, a hundred dollars a month. Nobody ever sold, uh, nobody ever saved a hundred dollars a month. They just saved 50 because we were college students. Mm. But in the month before I was going to graduate or in my final semester, I sold like 11 policies to my college buddies. And, and the great news is they became my earliest clients, right? The ones that finished before me, you know, started families before me, and then they bought term insurance from me when, when, when they started their families. So yeah, it was, yeah, 1994, they, they started in life insurance. And then, you know, gradually as the industry changed, um, you know, we became financial advisors. Oh, that's great. Uh, You know, and, you know, I get getting really kind of into the meat of this um, discussion it's something we know that is important, but yet at the same time, we're kind of really unfamiliar with the terms, the the uh, the plans, uh, you know, what it means and stuff. And so I, if you can dumb it down for, for us, you know, can you explain what life insurance is and kind of how it works? Yeah, at the at the most basic level, there's two kinds of insurance. There's term insurance, which is like rent. You, you pay your premiums a certain amount of time and then you essentially get evicted by the insurance company. And uh, the industry standard, because we recommend, I mean, I I work with Northwestern Mutual, but we're independent business owners, so I can represent every company out there. So I know this for a fact, you know, less than 1% of term policies actually pays out because people aren't alive when, when, when that policy, or they aren't, that policy is not in in effect when that person's, you know, passes away. So typically less than 1% will ever get paid out because people will buy term insurance. It's really inexpensive. The insurance company has designed it that way. And then you live a certain amount of years and then you outlive it and it expires. It's like rent. Yeah. And then the other, the other policy is whole life or permanent or universal or whatever they're called. And they have an equity component to it. And that equity components, you know, tied to a million different things. Sometimes it's the financial security of the company. Sometimes it's the market. Sometimes it's some index. I mean, yeah. So dumbing it down, there's term insurance is like rent. Permanent insurance is like owning where you build equity. And, and uh, you know, it, do you recommend a certain type for individuals that are a certain age or? You know, um, the, the financial planner in me and the financial advisor in me uh, looks at a person's entire situation and, and tries to discern whether the client's got some kind of need for tax, tax favored savings, and then we'll discuss a permanent insurance. But, you know, two teachers or two people, you know, not having a, 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 a huge tax hit every year, I always recommend term insurance. Um, I, I, you know, it, it, it's just important because, I mean, should something happen to me, I have a 17 and a 15 year old, something happens to me. The mortgage still needs to get paid. College still needs to get taken care of. My wife still needs to have some kind of living expenses if something happens to me, even at, with with kids being seventeen to fifteen. Now, uh, how do you determine? I mean, you know, when you talked about the the two teachers and so forth, how do you determine how much life insurance coverage someone should should get? You know, everything right now you can, you can go online and uh, you know I can punch in a calculator to determine you know, what my mortgage payment would be at, at a particular interest rate. Is there some type of calculator or determination as to how much um, 
an individual or I guess in, in this in a lot of these situations, a family should should get. Yeah, most people dumb it. I mean, to, to again to, to to make it super basic, most people want to protect three things: a mortgage. Um, and we're not talking about the death benefit coming and then us paying off the mortgage completely, but having the the bank of cash available to pay off the mortgage. I mean, we'll still pay it on a month to month basis for the deduction, but a mortgage, college education, and uh, a survivor income of some sort. So if if someone needs two thousand a month, we'll put aside four hundred thousand, and there's some math that goes to that as part of the life insurance component. So three things really survivor income, um, mortgage and, and, uh, college education. And obviously that would, that would, uh, change. I mean, those calculations change depending on what other assets the client may have. Right. Or. And yeah, I mean, we do, I mean, that, that's part of the, 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 the frustration I have with other people that do what I do is, you know, we, we want to ask the questions like what's important to you. I had one guy say, I'm only giving my wife a hundred thousand dollars. She can work at McDonald's. Now he didn't say that with her in the room, <laughs> but, but or, or, uh, or probably in the, uh, probably in the room with a the therapist either. He's not saying he's not, he's not going to be saying that. So uh, you know, everybody's got their own personal preference. It's not like car insurance where you have to have a certain amount. I mean, life insurance, some, I mean, my dad doesn't see the need for it at all. And I said, well, dad, you know, what happens if you, something would happen to you, we would have been destitute. And then his answer is, well, we will didn't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's very, it's very personal, right? Money's very personal. And so when you say, I want to make sure that my spouse has the mortgage, uh, the college education and a lot of survivor income. I don't want my spouse to worry about anything. Then you're saying, put in a lot of life insurance. And then we usually put a, a big term insurance policy on someone. And, and how many years, how many years um, of that policy do you get? Is it, and is there a, um, is there a break point? Is there, is there, is there a, uh, an end date? Um, Cause I'm sure all that gets calculated in, right? Oh, that's a great question actually. So, the, the term insurance companies, they have like a five-year level, a 10-year level, not a five-year level, but they have a 10-year, a 15, a 20, a 25, and a 30. And um, and again, if they offer a 30-year level for someone who's 30, and then they're 60 and it's going to expire, the client might say, hey, I'm 60 years old. I'd like to keep my insurance going. They're going to see their premiums astronomically jump because now the insurance money does want to get, you know, get paid for the amount of money that they're offering that coverage for. So um, yeah, they, they typically offer like an increasing plan, a level plan, and it's just a, a personal preference. Do you want to pay, you know, a different amount every year that increases based on your likelihood of dying being higher? Or do you want to make a level premium where it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but you can count on your premium staying the same. So it's just a personal preference. Um an actuary would say, don't do a level plan in your 30s, um, but in your 50s and 60s and maybe mid 40s, yes. Well, you know, you've been you've been doing this, you know, since since you uh, graduated from Sac State. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what are some of the changes that you've seen in the industry? Um, what are some of the changes do you that you anticipate coming into the future? Originally, we were like your 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 brick and mortar life insurance people like we were no different from Allstate, State Farm. Um, Prudential, New York Life, Mass Mutual. We were all the same. We all sold life insurance. And then when when everybody consolidated and the banks could do life insurance and we could do financial planning, everybody's doing the same thing now. And so what's changed for me personally is that all my friends and all the people my age, I, like I said, I turned 50 this year, we all have our life insurance right now. Um, and so what's next is financial planning and wealth management. And so our advisors my age are not talking about life insurance as much as they're talking about parents' long-term care insurance, um, mm -hmm. their own retirement. I mean, one thing that I, that I realize as I get older is everyone has financial insecurity. You got a hundred grand a month coming in, you have financial insecurity. You got five grand a month coming in, you have financial insecurity. And like, it's just, it's really hard to you know, it's, it's a very emotional thing. So there's always some kind of level of insecurity about it. And so, uh, yeah, now we're handling people's retirement, uh, as well as their life insurance. 
Well, you know, that's interesting because the next thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, what, what are some of the changes or, uh, that you see in people coming to you and, you know, some of the, some of the trends that you see in, and, you know, you brought up something really interesting, which is people coming to you and looking at uh, long-term care insurance for the parents. I've got, you know, um, Amy and I, we've got a couple friends of ours who have been dealing with that right now. Um, luckily for, for both in, in both situations, you know, and, and they're all a little bit different, you know, they, the, they, in one of them, you know, they had the insurance, um, that's, that they're paying into the other one, you know, the, I think the, um, husband and wife, they, they did have quite a bit of savings and they planned financially in case they needed some of that. But I, you know, for a lot of other folks, I mean, it is, it is a situation. I've got my best friend who's, you know, um, looking, looking at care for, for his mom and, for a lot of folks, financial, I mean, that can just crush a family because you're looking at, I mean, I've been hearing these rates somewhere between $7,000 and $13,000 every single month. Yeah. Um, the reason why long-term care policies are so expensive is because they're being used. People are living longer and they're being used. And so, you know, I have a policy on my wife and I, my wife's five years older than me. And hers is very expensive because she's female and she tends, she'll probably live longer. Um, so yeah, the, I, the, the numbers I heard from one of my, my, my best friend's mom was in, was in a hospice and he said, you know, not thank God, but she only lived three months on hospice. It was 10 grand a month. Uh, and they used her assets to do that. But, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's crushing. And, and to sit there and think you've built this wealth uh, of, of retirement assets, of 401ks, of mutual funds, of stocks, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you get to your retirement years and, you know, you had every intention of giving it to your children, you know, as a, as a legacy planning a vehicle, but instead now you need a long-term care uh, situation and it gets just dwindled down fast. So, you know, when we do reviews, we look at everything, the life insurance, the retirement, the long-term care, the college planning, it's all important. And, you know, some people are fortunate. They've got it all taken care of. Some people have family, some people have none of it. And then we just say, let's get, let's get what's more important right now. And then we'll do a review and we'll do it again. You know, we'll see what's new next year. For a lot of folks in, in you know, especially folks who are, you know, immigrants or um, folks that, you know, they're closely knit families, you've got this idea that at least in, in, in the, I'll say in the Mexican culture where it's like, well, someone, one of the kids will take care of me. You know, this idea that, you know, one of the kids is going to, is going to look after one of the, you know, the parents and stuff should, should one pass away, then, you know, the other parent goes to, to the kid. But I mean, the reality is that, you know, as, as, uh, as we're living longer, the ailments, the, you know, uh, you know, I've, some of these friends, you know, they've got uh, parents who've got dementia. Um, they've got, they've got other, other, other health problems. And is there any recommendation you would do for, whether it's the someone for their parents or some, you know, someone to plan out for the parents or the parents themselves looking to plan out for themselves for some of this long-term care. Cause like I said, you know, I've, I've got my parents who are, who are aging. They've luckily they've got some assets which they can utilize, but I mean, I, I don't know if the assets are going to be able to sustain them, you know, should, should they live for 15 years or 20 years with, with some type of ailments, you know um, unless, you know, they came over and lived with one of us. Yeah, that's so. I'll tell you a couple sides of that 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 story. Just that you didn't ask this question, but it's important. Um, it's the emo so I love my dad. He's my hero. I would do anything for him. You know, this driving to the Bay Area every two weeks is not because he needs me. Although I I kind of enjoy being around him. Like I even told my dad, you know, I miss you when I leave. You know, I've got a family to go back to, but I miss you when I leave. Right. And he kind of scoffed at that because Greeks aren't supposed to be emotional, um, but. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Hector, when I get back on Sunday night to start my work week, Monday morning, I always have a real tough time getting out of bed because it's emotionally draining to think about another adult. Like it's already hard with a with a spouse and two teenagers. But but for an, a, an, an 80 year old adult who you're like, you know, you take him to go out, get all of his groceries, et cetera. That's the emotional side. Right. So to the extent that you can offload that on someone at least a little bit. They say that a caretaker get takes a beating. So your, to answer your question, yeah, long-term care insurance is important. Um, 
just because you want somebody that's there to, to offload when you need a break. Yeah. And, you know, I, and I guess, I mean, it, it's going to go into these two things. It's like, when, when is a good time to plan for life insurance? When is a good time to start planning for um, this long-term care insurance? And, you know, if if I if I plan for my long term care insurance at forty, obviously I'm going to have a different rate than if I plan it at fifty or sixty. And are there plans where it stays the same, or you know, I think you, yeah. you understand what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sadly, yeah. sadly, with all insurances, they're all age based, right? right? And 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 so the older you get, the more expensive it's going to be. Um, when we're having a conversation, I would tell you that fifty years old is a time to start thinking about it. Most of my clients buy it in their 60s um, for whatever reason. Um, but but if if we're talking, if we're having a review, it's going to come up uh, in your 50s. 40s is a little bit too soon, I think, you know, because, you, you know, let's say you live, you know, to your mid 80s before you have a long term care event. You're paying premiums for 40 years. And it doesn't mean that just because you're paying for 40 years, it means that you're going to have more of a benefit. So. With all with all insurance, you just want to make sure that you're insurable at the time that you want it. So you don't want to wait until you're 70. Um, life insurance, you know, the second you have a mortgage and kids, you should probably start thinking about it. Um, retirement, you should start thinking about it for, you know, as soon as you can um, to make sure compounding interest works in your favor. But um, but yeah, I long term care is probably like 50s and 60s. You know, I, I like I like that. I like the the. Um you know, the long-term care 50, you know, at 50, start planning for that. I, I, you know, I think it, I think it's a great number to have that, you know, once, once you're, once you've got the family or really once you got that, have that mortgage and family and maybe some of those kids, it's, it's the um, life insurance. And we'll make sure that down in the, down in the notes and stuff or the description, we, we put some of those, I, I'll run it by you first, obviously yeah, sure. it down there for folks. Um, because that gives, I think that gives them a, a good, a good kind of kind of a number or an area of when when they should start planning for this. Now, you know, in in looking at these at these two two items, you know, are there what are some of the obstacles people face when shopping or applying for life insurance or long term care um, that you see kind of, that pops up? The the obstacles are like anything else. There's too much information out there. It's 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 analysis paralysis, right? So, you know, during the dot com days, Hector, there was this thing where people were just going to use they're going to buy life insurance online. What they found out quickly was it's not that easy. Right now, after COVID, underwriters are difficult to work with, not because of insurability issues, but they're working from home. Yeah. So what used to take six to eight weeks, you're now wondering why it takes four weeks just to get it in front of an underwriter. So that's super difficult. So yeah, the the, the dot com stuff made it super difficult. So uh, I just forgot your question. I'm sorry, Hector, go ahead. Oh, no, no, like, like what obstacles do people face? Oh, yeah, people, yeah too there. much information. Too yeah. much information um, makes it so that people don't know what's right, right? Just like politics, just like everything else. Yeah. There's so much coming at you. You just don't know what to, de- de- you know, how to discern it. Yeah, just yeah, that's why I, I say find a person, an advisor that's someone that you know knows, that's someone that you know trusts, that's someone that you know has been working with for a long time. And just run it by them versus try to learn it from TV, the news, an article you read, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect. Now, can uh, do you can you share with us any personal experiences or stories of you know where life insurance played a critical role in someone's life or even the long term care in in caring for their loved ones? Yeah, I'll tell you um, uh, life insurance for two ways. Um, so I, you know, thankfully, I've not had that many. Uh, death claims in 29 years, people don't, you know, thankfully people don't die, but <clears throat> one of my, there was a client sadly that, um, that was ready to retire. Uh, they had their whole life plan. They were going to move out of the country and they had their whole life plan. And literally within like months, they found out that they had some kind of debilitating cancer. And, uh, this person passed away. And, um, in my situation, this was the one time where I, uh, with a surviving spouse, I had this great relationship with. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so that was nice that it was in place. Another person bought it right before they got MS. And so mm-hmm. some misinformation that's out there, if you have the policy and it's in place, 
and you develop some kind of illness afterwards, you're fine. That's why you get insured when you do. You get insured when you're healthy. And so this person got MS. Um, the company paid for the premiums because of the MS through a disability waiver. And then she ended up passing away 14 years later, and each of her children got $250,000. Wow. So they were able to buy their homes um, and, and not have a mortgage uh, when she passed away. So they'd rather have their mom, but but they got yeah. the they got this. Um, long-term care, I will tell you, I haven't had that experience yet for one of my clients where they're paying the claim. But I will tell you that I had to take, the reason why my wife and I bought our policy when we did was because I spent one weekend taking care of my father-in-law um, before he passed. Um, and I'm 5'10", and I'm pretty, you know, I'm fit. <laughs> but my father-in-law was six foot five and 300 pounds. Yeah. You know, Jim, you know, I think you, I think you've said it best is, you know, it's not just the, not just the uh, physical, but it's also the emotional. It's a, you know, it's having someone there at times who can kind of give you that break, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's the, um, you know, like with my, with some of my friends that, who are going through this with their parents is, you know, they're, as they're getting the break, but they're still dealing with the, you know, getting, getting all the financial stuff in order in, in one particular situation, the, the husband passed away the, um, you know, few months later than, you know, the wife, you know, she's, her dementia's gotten um, significantly worse. They've got her in a place. And so it, it's, it is, and then plus, you know, they've got their jobs and everything kind of, they're trying to juggle so many things at the same time. It's tough. It's tough. You, you know, Hector, uh, you and I are of the age. So, you know, the conversations I'm having with, you know, you go through these different, different life stages, right? You, you're in college with friends and you're enjoying your best life and then you get married and then you're laughing about, this is why comedians make so much money, right? You're laughing about the silliness of relationships and then you have kids and raising them and those are silly stories. Um, at 50, the conversations are, if you're thankful enough to, or if you're lucky enough to have parents still alive, it's that taking care of them. Um, you know, and, and, and I, it's, it, it just, it's hard. It's, I have, I have friends that are going through dementia, parents with dementia. And, you know, I've got my dad, which is the most, you know, easiest one, but I have other friends that you can tell they're just worn out from taking care of their families. And so, yeah. you know, thankfully we have our parents, but it's still hard to, to take care of them. Yeah. Well, well, Jim, you know, thank you for taking the time to um, educate us on and discuss, you know, these really important and I mean, just really um, personal topics uh, is because it is, it is, it is personal for a lot of folks. And it's, you know, oftentimes we're kind of left with, um, with not knowing, you know, being unsure. And, and you're right. We go online, we try to get all this information and there's a lot of misinformation and oftentimes it just kind of raises more questions. And I was wondering, you know, with your permission, if it's okay if I can put your contact information in the yeah. description of this podcast. That way, you know, that way people, if they've got any questions, they can contact you directly. And, you know, you guys can can answer, uh, you know, have a, have a nice conversation back and forth. Because I know that once we're done with this podcast, I'm probably going to have a few more questions, you know, down the line right. as, I, as I, you know, look back at this, at this uh, conversation we had. And, you know, I'm going to be sending you my questions. Yeah. No. Yeah. Please, please uh, share my information. I think what I want to share um, when, when people call us, we don't charge for our time. We don't charge for financial plans. You know, people call and, you know, one thing I said is I'm not running a charity, but I'm happy to talk to people if it's not going to make me any money, but it makes someone feel better. Right. Mm -hmm. If it gives somebody some kind of sense of comfort in the conversation we had. So, you know, if someone calls and says, Hey, I want to run this by you you know, I want it to be a positive interaction where they go, you know, I don't need Jim now, but maybe I'll need him in the future. But I remember he gave me a really nice answer that made me feel better about the direction we were taking, et cetera. I mean, like I said, money is very, makes people insecure. And there's every, a lot of people have money insecurities and, and to the best that I can help kind of make society better doing that. I will. Well, Jim, before we let you go, you know, we'd love to, we, we, we ask our guests, to suggest two books or movies or a mixture of both that you would recommend to our audience and, and, uh, and why? You know, what movie I love is, and, and my dad laughs, I'm always watching the Godfather. There's something about the family dynamic that the Godfather gets, gets so well, right? There's the one, there's the brother that's methodical and calculated, the brother that's meek and, and needs help. And there's the brother that's got a temper and then the sister that kind of tries to be the glue 
So, and then, and then all the dynamics of that. Right. And, uh, I love the Godfather, not number three. Uh, I'm a big star Wars guy being born in 1973. Um, books. I knew you were going to ask that because I haven't listened to your podcast. I'm reading a book right now called ego is the enemy. Mm -hmm. And, and it's good for someone like me because we are around a lot of people that make a lot of money sometimes and the ego becomes their undoing. Yeah. Um, and so ego is the enemy is and then another book I did prep this, uh, psychology of money by Morgan Housel. So that the premise of that book is, you know, someone like my father's done very well for himself with zero formal education, right? And then you have someone who's a Wharton School of Business, top of the class graduate that's broke because they had this low self-esteem where they had to keep up with someone. And then they, you know, that ended up taking them down where they started screwing people over and then they're doing jail time. So psychology money is a big one because, you know, most people will go broke because of their own bad habits. And most people will be successful regardless of how much money they made because of their good habits. So. Well, it goes right, it goes right back into what you said about your father. You know, if you made 10 bucks, he's saving he's saving nine. That's the same, same concept my my parents had. It it is, you know, they they had this, they knew what they were gonna save every single month. And it's like they're like like squirrels, they were just gonna put it away, put it away, put it away, not knowing for what, but right. it was gonna go away, it was gonna be put away. When you approached me, um, Hector, I, I was very honored that you thought that I would have a good story to tell and be on your podcast. But, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud about in my life, besides a volunteer, I mean, ESAC literally was a lot of fun. I didn't have a, those parents were amazing. And if I could hug them all, I will. So ESAC literally was a very wonderful, like uh, volunteer experience just because, you know, you're, you're, you're coaching baseball and you're up. I mean, just, I run by the, the, the ESAC literally fields on my runs and just think about all the great memories. But um, one thing that I'm super proud of is my work with Junior Achievement of Sacramento, where they teach kids kindergarten through senior year workforce readiness and financial literacy. And boy, do we need that now more than ever. And, you know, one of the one of the things I thought about is I was so lucky to be born to my mom and dad. Right. You can't pick your parents. And so thank God my dad taught me I'm buying a Snickers box. You know, there's a box of 24 of these Snickers. And I'm going to sell them for 50 cents, but the price per Snickers is 24 cents. So it means we make 26 cents and that's what we keep the lights on. So I teach kids, you know, through junior achievement, those same lessons, right? That, that, you know, don't spend everything that you make, put some money aside for a rainy day. I mean, it just, you know, that's not a socioeconomic thing, although sometimes it can be. That's just, you know, there's a lot of people that make a lot of money that still don't know those lessons too, which is why they run up credit cards when they don't need to. Yeah. So, yeah, super proud of that work. I'm super proud of what they do. And, um, yeah, I think that that volunteerism kind of translates into what we do for uh, professionally. Well, Jim, thank you for your time once again and for sharing the stories you know, about your dad you know, growing up. And, I you know, this – this uh, and I know we were going to talk about life insurance, but even – you know, thank you for for allowing us to, to kind of venture off in the long term care because I think for a lot of folks um, listening and and just just kind of in general, you you don't like I don't want to leave or be that burden, you know, over to my daughters. You know, they're they're young right now, and you know, your father time is never wrong, and you know, being able to get kind of this information and 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 get it out there for folks and you know, and thank you for making yourself available that if folks have any questions, they can con they can email you or so forth to contact you. Um, really appreciate all that. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to help. Um, I always say that um, and I mean it. Um, financial security is is on everyone's mind. You know, like I said, nowadays, it really is now more than ever. They're not getting that financial literacy at school these days. And that's why we go in there, you know, as a, junior, as a, as a volunteer group. But, you know, it's super important. Well, thank you, Jim. You have, you have a great day. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Appreciate it.